What is the nasal septum and why is it deviated in most adults? How does the septal deviation impact nasal breathing? And most importantly, when should I get it corrected? I'm Dr. Allen, a fellowship trained rhinologist or sinus expert. And today we're going to take a look at the nasal septum, how septal abnormalities cause nasal obstruction, when septoplasty surgery is needed, and an overview of the procedure and the recovery period. The nasal septum divides the nasal cavities and it extends from the base of the skull down to the floor of the nose. You can easily see the front portion of the septum which starts in an area known as the columella and separates the two nostrils. The back of the septum extends to the back of the nasal cavities and ends at the opening of the nasal pharynx. The front or anterior portion of the septum is composed of cartilage while further back or posteriorly it is composed of bone. The mucosa or lining over the bone and cartilage can be very thin when atrophic or very thick when inflamed from allergies and impacted by chronic nasal decongestant use. Swell bodies near the front of the septum can enlarge on and off similar to the nasal turbinates and may have a variable impact on nasal airflow while the remainder of septal abnormalities such as deviations and spurs result in fixed or constant airflow obstructions. It's estimated that about 80% of adults have some degree of septal deviation. Only a small portion of these septal abnormalities are caused by apparent trauma and these usually result in immediate difficulty with nasal breathing compared to before that trauma. Most septal deviations actually result from overgrowth in the vertical height of the septum in relation to the skull, resulting in bowing or shifting to one or both sides that worsens over time. Spurs result from abnormal thickening or horizontal growth of bone or cartilage from the septum. In most cases, the degree of septal deviation is mild and doesn't significantly impact nasal breathing. In moderate to severe septal deviations, the airflow on one or both sides of the nose is impacted. This may become noticeable intermittently, such as when a turbinate swells on the side of a septal deviation, or it can impact nasal breathing all of the time, such as when a large bone spur or a severe deviation completely obstructs one side of the nose. Most septal deviations only impact one side of the nose, but a smaller percentage deviate to both sides, forming an S shape. This can impair nasal breathing on both sides to varying degrees. Even a slight narrowing at the wrong location within the nasal airway, such as the valve, may significantly increase airflow resistance and be felt as an obstruction. As I pointed out in my turbinate video, this impact on nasal breathing is explained by the following physics principle, which states, flow through a tube is impacted by the radius of the tube or how open it is to the fourth power. In other words, any narrowing at key areas of airflow resistance within the nose have a dramatic impact on the overall airflow through the nose. A more open nose also allows the air to flow in a laminar fashion or with less turbulence, which decreases the effort needed to breathe well through the nose. Nasal congestion is one of the most common reasons that patients seek help from an ENT surgeon. Inadequate nasal breathing might be present all of the time or may fluctuate and be present only at specific times, such as while lying down trying to sleep. Congested patients are evaluated in the clinic using a combination of physical exam, nasal endoscopy, and CT imaging that is often available in the clinic setting. Looking into the nostrils with a light often misses important causes of nasal obstruction deep within the nose, so it's important to use nasal endoscopy or CT imaging to confirm the causes of obstruction before planning any definitive treatments. When someone presents with obstruction symptoms and the septum is found to be moderately or severely deviated or has a significant spur filling a portion of the airway, surgical correction is generally recommended as these fixed anatomical obstructions will not improve with medications alone. Septoplasty or surgical correction of the septum is performed through the nostrils using either a direct view with a headlight or an endoscopic view using a video tower and small scopes and instruments. Endoscopic approaches are gaining in popularity as they ensure that good visualization is possible to the very back of the nose so that spurs and other problems within the posterior septum are not missed. The incisions are generally hidden within the nose as are any dissolvable sutures used to close the incisions. The bone and cartilage within the septum are straightened and some portions are removed including any spurs that are present. Care is taken to maintain structural support at the front of the nose by leaving a portion of septal cartilage intact or otherwise supported with cartilage grafts. In some cases, plastic splints are secured to the septum to provide added structural support while initially healing. These splints are unnecessary in many cases where the septum's natural structural support can be maintained without compromising breathing results from surgery. General anesthesia or IV sedation are used to eliminate discomfort during the procedure, which varies in length from a few minutes in simple cases to an hour or more when combined with other procedures such as turbinoplasty or endoscopic sinus surgery. 
Patients are then discharged home from the recovery room once they're fully awake and doing well after their procedure. Postoperative care involves nasal saline irrigations, activity restrictions to avoid nosebleeds, and post-op visits to inspect the nose and remove splints when applicable and ensure that the septum is healing appropriately. Mild to moderate discomfort around the nose and occasionally in the teeth or the roof of the mouth gradually improves over about one to two weeks after the procedure. Unless a rhinoplasty is also performed, the outside of the nose and face generally do not exhibit any significant swelling or bruising during the recovery period. In most cases, the inside of the nose appears completely healed in about one to two months after surgery, at which point the nasal saline irrigations can be discontinued unless they're needed to manage your other conditions such as allergic rhinitis. No surgery is risk-free, but luckily septoplasty is a safe and commonly performed procedure with a very low chance for complications. Aside from the usual milder bleeding noted on and off after any nasal surgery and the usual mild to moderate discomfort initially, the risk of any lasting symptoms from a septoplasty complication is very rare. The most common long-term complication is a perforation through the septum, which in studies occurs in 2-3% of cases. Most of these perforations are small and do not cause any symptoms. Larger perforations might lead to crusting or intermittent nosebleeds and may require surgical correction or silicone implants to prevent airflow through that perforation. More severe post-op bleeding is extremely rare while healing from septoplasty alone, but can require interventions such as nasal packing in more severe cases. Other rare complications include decreased smell function, prolonged crusting or healing in areas of the nose, scars or adhesions to adjacent structures in the nose, and numbness in the upper dentition or upper lip that in nearly every case resolves over a few weeks to a few months. Lastly, in some cases requiring more extensive work at the anterior septum, the cartilage can shift or remodel while healing, resulting in some ongoing deviations that's generally less significant than the original septal deformity. Septoplasty is one of the most common surgeries performed by ENT surgeons and has a long track record of safety and efficacy in restoring normal breathing when abnormalities of the septum are the cause of nasal congestion. For many, improved nasal breathing results in better sleep, less snoring, and in some cases has even been linked to fewer episodes of headaches and facial pain. I hope you found this video about the nasal septum and septoplasty procedures helpful and informative. Let me know if you have any other ENT topics you'd like me to cover in the future videos and feel free to ask questions in the comments. If you'd like to see me as a patient, please visit me at my website at premiersinus.com or call my Houston surgeons at 713-791-0700 for an appointment. Thanks for watching.